or after the regulatory portion? I think we'll go through the regulatory portion. I think that's what we had on our agenda. Does that sound good with you, Jim? Yeah, it's great. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to talk about uh, how the FDA and other international regulatory agencies regulate and sell in gene therapies. And it's the same tension that they have with all drugs. They do not want to hold up the drug uh, development process. On the other hand, they don't want to make a mistake and approve something that's going to end up being dangerous. And so uh, there is this tightrope act and along the way they, they're learning along with the companies and the scientists within the companies and these analytical techniques that we've been talking about today are in flux. New ones are being added. This one's uh, uh, better and therefore we're going to substitute it. And the FDA is going along uh, with the companies and learning along the way. Uh, next slide, please. You cannot talk about gene therapy without talking about the case of Jesse Gelsinger. Uh, this case set back gene therapy a decade and we're really only now recovering from it. He was a teenager and uh, he died in September, 1999 as a result of a of a reaction that he had to a gene therapy product uh, in a gene therapy trial. He had been born with a genetic disorder, a mild form of ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. And that enzyme is an enzyme in the urea cycle. Uh, in children, it can be quite severe and, uh, and fatal, but uh, he was able to control his uh, with a low protein diet uh, cutting back on the nitrogen, and then taking 32 pills a day. Next slide, please. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania had been working on a gene therapy treatment for this particular condition. And after another candidate dropped out, they recruited Jesse Gelsinger. They recruited him. He was 16 at the time. They had to wait until he turned 18 so he could give consent. And what they told him, that he wouldn't really benefit from the treatment, but if they if he participated, uh, it would generate valuable information about this treatment that would save future babies that had the more severe form of the disease. And so when he was 18, he consented and uh, uh, was given informed consent, that is uh, informed consent, although, uh, spoiler alert, there were problems with the informed consent. Uh, in those days, they used an adenovirus vector, not AAV, uh, adenovirus uh, had been for years sort of the E. coli of animal viruses. It was what everyone knew about, what everyone worked on. And so it sort of was a logical vector to choose in order to, um, in order to uh, get the gene into his body in this trial. It had been tested before in mice, monkeys, baboons, and one human patient. And so he was given the treatment on September 13, and it went bad almost right away. Within a day, he slipped into a coma. His uh, nitrogen levels went up. He uh, was declared brain dead, and his parents uh, allowed them to remove him uh, from the respirator, on, and he died on September 17. So relatively quickly. Next slide, please. There were a lot of problems with this. So everyone tried to find out what had gone wrong. Uh, well, the University of Pennsylvania team investigated and suggested that his immune system had a response to the adenovirus and it triggered a fatal reaction. An autopsy was performed and the batch of virus was recovered. And uh, it turned out there wasn't any impurities in the virus preparation that they could find. The Food and Drug Administration moved in, they launched an investigation, and they began a civil lawsuit uh, against the university and against individuals on the team. Journalists be began their own investigations. The, Gel the Gelsinger family hired lawyers to find out the details of the death, and they sued in a tort case. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania launched, launched its own investigation. So you have all of these parallel investigations, including two lawsuits going on. The university, uh, within, uh, within a few months, shut the program down. 
and the setback gene therapy research for a decade. So um, a lot of things came out of this because of the two lawsuits, everyone clamped down on their information and also because the lawsuits were, were settled out of court, the details of the lawsuits never quite came out. But regardless, this was a disaster for gene therapy. Again, as I put, it set it back for a decade and it's only slowly recovering from this case. So next slide. So the FDA has the responsibility to not allow something like this to happen again. At the same time, balancing that with not holding up these therapies that are going to cure children of terrible diseases. And so it's a balancing act there. And it's up to this fellow, Peter Marks, who is the head of CBER. So you have CBER, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research in the Food and Drug Administration. The office within CBER that covers this is the Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies. And there is a committee called the Initial Targeted Engagement for Regulatory Advice on CBER Products, Interact. And that's who the, a company who is bringing a gene therapy or a cell therapy to market should be talking with regularly. And the FDA is saying, we don't want you to put it all together and come back to us at the end. We want an ongoing conversation. We want to work along with you to bring these uh, products to market. Next slide, please. So at the core of all of this is good manufacturing practice. Good manufacturing practice in the United States under Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 211. Uh, in the EU, the Uterlex Volume 4 is good manufacturing practice. And then uh, in the harmonized ICH documents, uh, it's Q7. And I recommend that you have your students uh, review one or both of these. Q7 might be the best. Again, uh, in the ICH, it's a committee. It started with the three countries, the United States, the European Union, and Japan, and trying to develop a common document that everyone could agree on uh, rather than separate documents so that uh, these therapies could more easily move forward. Now, Europe's regulatory agencies jumped out ahead of the United States, frankly. In Europe, they call them an ATMP, an Advanced Therapy Medicinal Products. And the European Uterlex uh, developed the, a specific guidelines for GMP, for what you have to follow for ATMPs. And so they have their own GMP guidelines on uh, cell and gene therapy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, under the FDA, companies can apply to any of these FDA designations whose goal is to expedite or to hurry up these therapies. The, the therapies are valuable. Uh, there are patients waiting for them. There are children waiting for them. And so the FDA would like to uh, uh, be careful, but to, to work with these. So fast track designation, a process designed to facilitate the development and expedite the review of drugs to see, treat serious conditions and fill an unmet medical need. <clears throat> so you can apply for fast track designation status. That is, this is not a me too drug. This is something for which there's an unmet medical need. There is currently no treatment. I would like fast track de designation. Breakthrough designation, a process designed to expedite the development and review of drugs, which may demonstrate substantial improvement over available therapy. Accelerated approval, drugs for serious conditions that fill an unmet medical need <clears throat> can be approved in a clinical trial, not based on a typical input, uh, endpoint, uh, how long do the patients, uh, how many, what percentage of the patients survive uh, in the next five years, but on a surrogate endpoint, uh, does it shrink the tumor? Something that you can agree on. Priority review, 
uh, a company can pay for this and it uh, under priority review, the FDA commits to take action on an application within six months. And then in this designation, regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation. The request for this designation must be made either concurrently or with uh, the submission of the first application of the FDA, the investigational new drug application, or as an amendment to an existing IND. So uh, companies can apply for one or more of these, and the FDA says, uh, contact us uh, often, keep us involved. We're trying to move these drugs along, but no one wants another Jesse Gelsinger. Next slide, please. So for the United States, um, multiple documents hit in January, 2020. And I have my class go to these original documents and read them. There's some repetition in them. Uh, remember that you have the laws that are enacted by the, the legislature, by the House of Representatives and the Senate, signed by the president. The law that we're, that we're operating under uh, is the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938 as amended, especially the Harris Kefauver Amendments of 1962, and we're under that law, but laws are not specific. And so the FDA will determine, will develop regulations, and they publish those in Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations. And but that is a lengthy process, and that takes collecting six months of collecting uh, comments from the regulated industry sorting through those comments and uh, rejecting some, uh, ad adopting some, yes, you're right. Uh, I can see how what we, where we wrote, what we wrote here would have the following unintended consequences. So we will make changes. And then they finally uh, publish them as the final uh, documents and they go into the CFRs. The FDA has been doing a lot with guidance documents, and this is what we are thinking. And there's a disclaimer right up front in a guidance document that it said, uh, this does not carry the force of law. Uh, regulations carry the force of law. These guidance documents do not, but this is what we're thinking. And uh, it allows them to publish their thoughts without going through this lengthy a review process that would be required for a real regulation. On the other hand, if that's the, the way the FDA is thinking as a company, you had better follow it because their inspectors are going to be looking for these. And so let, let's take a look at these examples of guidance documents and what the FDA is looking for. Right off the bat, they came out with uh, guidance for gene therapies for hemophilia. These will be some of the first of the gene therapy treatments that come out. And so that was logical. Uh, human gene therapy for retinal disorders. Uh, Luxturna is already out. And so this is another area where there are products out and more products come out. That makes sense. Human gene therapy for rare diseases. Well, that makes sense. And uh, that gene therapies are going to be, have to be applied to these rare diseases. And Take a look at what they want next. Testing of retroviral-based human gene therapies for replication-competent retroviruses during product manufacturing patient follow-up. Follow-up. If your retrovirus viral vector is constructed properly, the guts of it will have been taken out and replaced with your gene of interest. And so it should not be able to replicate on its own. It should merely be a delivery system of your gene of interest into a cell. And so you have to test uh, as part of the analytics that we've been talking about, uh, incubate your sample with uh, permissive cells uh, to see if any viruses are produced. Our next chemical manufacturing and control information for human gene therapy, investigational new drug applications. Um, CMC is an important part of an investigational new drug application. It's an important part of the submission. Uh, these are the details. 
how am I going to manufacture uh, this product? Uh, what is the chemistry of the product? How am I going to control every unit operation operated in a state of control? And so this is guidance on how you do that uh, for gene therapies. And then uh, how do you carry out a long-term follow-up after administration of human gene therapy products? And so what do, you, what do you do to monitor the patient to make sure that nothing is going wrong? Uh, the worry here is for those gene therapy products that do integrate into the genome, uh, where might they integrate into the genome? Are they going to inter integrate next to an oncogene? Uh, well, uh, you're going to have to follow up and take patient samples and, and test for that. Uh, next slide. So uh, let me end there and say that this area is uh, an ongoing conversation between the industry and the FDA and international regulators. Again, like any biologic, it is this balancing act of the FDA. The FDA, and we saw this with the vaccines, the FDA wants to maintain their credibility as a consumer pr protection agency. They want to be strict, although they do not want to hold up these important therapies. And so uh, at, at the same time, the field is changing. Uh, people are learning more about cell and gene therapy, and the FDA is there keeping up. Uh, again, Peter Marks has been to every conference. They're all remote, but every conference that I went to in the last year and a half in this field, uh, uh, members of the FDA are always there uh, interacting. They're hiring uh, a whole new cohort of brand new postdocs. Uh, they're, they're hiring scientists with this expertise in order to allow them to be strict and to keep safe, and, but not hold up these Im important therapies. Uh, in the back of all of this, no one wants another Jesse Gelsinger case. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you, Jim. I think on the agenda now we have a, a short break if anybody needs to step away from a moment. Um, and, and we can also entertain during that time questions for Jim on regulatory aspects of cell and gene therapy. There were no questions in the chat, but it looks like. I have a question. So it's interesting. Um, I see that there's a new one too, in terms of it's on neurodegenerative diseases. So you can actually have your students look up a list of all of these. I think I'm gonna add that to my regulatory course. You know, I'm kind of interested to ask you guys, someone who teaches a QA, QC course, you know, you can, there's so many things you can add to this course. I'm interested in knowing your filters in your mind, what you feel are probably some of the most important things to put, because I mean, you could go overboard with all the different things you have your students do. I hope you don't mind me asking. Well, no, uh, let me give you my philosophy. So I teach uh, both lower division, upper division, and I teach those differently. And I, I think it's similar to the way that you would teach the technical aspect where in lower division, I use secondary sources. In okay. upper division, I have them dive into these primary sources into the guidance documents themselves. Okay. That's a good way to put it, like it. And, you know, so yeah, you, you tell them, okay, we're going into regulation. Uh, you know, uh, often they find <laughs> it less engaging than uh, the, the scientific side, which is just so fascinating and the you know, the technical side and the manufacturing side. Okay, let's talk about the FDA and regulations. Uh, but the, the point that I make is in an interview, your knowledge of that is going to make you stand out. Yeah. And uh, that is what is going to attract the attention of the person on the other side of the inter interview table, I think. Yeah. And, oh, I think there's a student. question from Casal, so I'm gonna get off and... Just to wrap that one up, uh, 
Linnea, I find that my students really enjoy going into the FDA website and looking at 483 forms and warning mm. letters. There's something about finding out what companies do wrong that really gets them into it. And then the response and then the follow up from the FDA if, if they don't um, you know, respond to everything that was outlined. So uh, I have a, a class where I do that with my students and they seem to enjoy that a lot. Yeah, I do There's that. A there's yeah. a great 483. It's uh, Emergent Biosystems, the uh, place that had so much trouble last year outside of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the one where they were taking, making two different viral preparations, uh, vaccine preparations, and they cross-contaminated them. And yeah. so then I, I have my students, you know, have a 483 and, you know, okay, tell me why this contamination happened. Uh, I want you to write an Ishika Ishikawa diagram and I want you to perform five whys and give me the root cause. And what was interesting is they have been indoctrinated by me so much that they did not blame the technicians. <laughs> no, that they said the design of the facility since it was retrofitted was such that it allowed these mistakes to be made. Mm -hmm. The te technicians made the mistakes, but the process should have been so robust that those mistakes could not have been made. And I'm going, ah, my job is done here. Yeah, well, you know, the whole thing is, so since so many of our quality, his, his, the history of quality really comes down to if they don't provide, if we don't provide the training, and education, then they're at fault. You know, it does, a lot relies on the company to do their job too. So, so I think if ahead. you don't mind, we'll, we'll come back to Kasau's question on hex cells versus SF9 cells in just a moment, uh, because ISO is going to talk more about hex 293 cells. And, um, and we'll come back to that if you don't mind. And, um, okay. But now we're going to move on to some of the, the hands-on um, curriculum, lab-based curriculum we've developed recently. And um, we're going to talk about the evaluation of AAV transduction of CHO cells. And, and then ISO is going to talk about HEC-293 cells and some of the analytical assays associated with that production.